Welcome to another En Face interview with one of the legends of British dance today. Today, we're meeting someone who heads really a whole gaggle of leg legends. Um, Tori Dobrin is the artistic director of the legendary American male ballerina comedy troupe Les Ballets Trocadero de Monte Carlo. And they've just landed in Britain this week for a two-month tour. Uh, how many tours of Britain is it that you've done? I think done? this is our 17th. 17th. Mm -hmm. The Brits absolutely love you. Yeah, yeah, we're very popular here, and we're happy about that, of course. Well, you landed, of course, in a historic week, um, yeah. landing in the, in the week of the Queen's death. Did you notice when that happened? I mean, it happened just, the announcement happened just before your a show on Thursday. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a little chaotic backstage because we didn't know whether we were going to perform. Uh, and so the people from Sadler's Wells came and told us, you know, what was going to happen. And everyone was sad, even though we're not directly connected to the, um, the Queen or the royal family being American and not Brits. Uh, but, you know, it was sad. Well, what I noticed was I was there, um, was that the audience started off sad and rather subdued, because there's a lot of them obviously hadn't heard the news. But by the end of the evening, they were just... Uproaring! I mean, they were just—they were so happy. Interestingly enough, the first time that we came back to London was right after uh, Diana had uh, died, and so we were here for that, and now we're here for this. So it's kind of—it's kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, to to make the comparison and share the big events. You're fated to make <laughs> lift the British people's spirits <laughs> after terrible events. Well, that's a nice way of looking at it, of course. Well, we can start off with an introduction to the Ballet Trocadero. Hundreds of thousands of people have seen us. I'm Robert Carter. My name is Hao Jun Xie. Hi, my name is Alberto Preto, and I'm a dancer with Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo. The Ballet Trocadero is actually an all-male comedy ballet company, so we take classical ballets and also modern styles, and uh, we uh, are trying to parody the, these styles, and we do it for comedic effect. The company was started in 1974, and in that period in New York City, particularly right after the Stonewall riots, there was a lot of drag, um, uh, elements in the city in a lot of clubs and a lot of bars people were experimenting with drag so the company really came out of that period and it was a bunch of guys who were like wanted to put on a show so they started doing these midnight shows parroting classical ballet and uh, it really took off who knew that 44 years later we were still uh, going to be in existence there's a, a flavor of what the, the Trocaderos are like and just how long they've been going. I mean, Tori, what was your first association with the Trocs? I joined as a dancer in 1980. The company was formed in 1974, so I came six years later. Uh, and were you a ballerina or a man? Because I reckon there's a pecking order, isn't there? You joined to be a ballerina, really. Uh, there was, no, there's no pecking order. You join to be part of the group and everyone is expected to do both ballerina and male roles. Uh, and it's just, in any dance company, they put you where you're needed. So, um, uh, because I'm a little bit boxy, uh, you know, broad shoulders, Never. I did a lot of the male roles, for sure. But we have a picture of you up there. What was your ballerina name? My ballerina name was Margaret, a dame, Margaret Low in Octane. Low in Octane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long, a pillar of Stonehenge Ballet. A pillar of the Stonehenge Ballet. Well, that's wonderful. Now, you do look, as a man, um, a bit unhinged up there. Well, that is the hallmark of Ballet Trocadero, to be unhinged. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I'm, that's my character is Adam Baum dancing with Natasha, not good enough. Oh, is that a splendid? That's your male name. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. Um, and there's a picture here, actually, of you. Here you are in the um, rather principal boy kind of look at the end. Uh, who is that in the middle? That is that a familiar face? Yes, it's Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. We were, we were doing a photo shoot in this big studio complex that had studio, um, lots of rehearsals and... She was doing um, a photo shoot for uh, Victor Victoria, the musical. I'm not sure if that was here. Yes. So we went over there and said, oh, would you take a picture with us? And she said, sure. She was absolutely a delight. How did it start for you? When did you get into dance in the first place? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s. 
I was born in 1954, so uh, Los Angeles was really an interesting place at that point, uh, and still is. Um, and um, I got into dance primarily, it's kind of a ridiculous story, there was an earthquake that happened and the neighboring school was destroyed. And so they had to come over to our school and um, um, because we all had to go on half days. And back then you had to have a physical activity. Uh, Kennedy had organized that everybody had to take a physical activity every day. But the men's PE was already full because we were on half day. So the, the teacher said, oh, just go over to the girls' gym and take dance. And I said, all right. And that's how it started. Did you soon get an idea that you'd like to be a professional dancer? No, it was more uh, an improvisational thing. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a freestyle hippie type movement. Uh, the woman was really into improvisation. So it was like, it was like group therapy, which is very uh, good for uh, a teenager. Uh, and so it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And then I got really involved in that. And she was a really good teacher, very inspiring. That's why it's so important in the education system to have inspiring teachers, as we know. And uh, she, she actually sent quite a few people from the public school. Public school meaning, um, I know it's different here, but in America, public school is where everyone goes. And uh, she, she generated a lot of, uh, of her students became professional dancers, me being one as well. There were a lot of ballet russe, old ballet russe teachers who had retired to Los Angeles because it was sunny and uh, beautiful. And so there were a lot of options for uh, taking classes outside of school. And presumably you started in other companies before you, you joined the Trox. Did you, did you dance professionally elsewhere? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I danced professionally in Los Angeles, and then I moved to Texas and danced there, and then decided to move to um, New York, and uh, actually was moving away from ballet. Uh, I started uh, auditioning for Broadway musicals, and I got a job at Radio City Music Hall, and that was really fun. And then... Um, the audition for Ballet Trocadero came, and a friend of mine was going and said, oh, you should come. And I went, all right, and I did, and joined. And that was, that was the beginning of it for me. It wasn't really a calculated plan. It just sort of happened. Had you done um, classical roles in your previous career? Not really. I was doing mostly uh, in the ballet companies. It was more modern uh, uh, work. Um, and so, no, not really, except for, of course, Every dancer in America does their nutcrackers and stuff like that, which, of course, I had done. But, but who were your inspirations as a dancer? Oh, wow. Now, as a kid. We're talking about 45 years ago, so <laughs> who remembers? <laughs> uh, um, I really don't remember, actually. You didn't? No. I, was, I assume that the uh, muses for the Trocaderos go back even further than before you and I were born. <laughs> For me, it all started uh, in really enjoying the, the old style. So right there is Mike Gonzalez, uh, who was a dancer with the company, but he joined as a, uh, as a costume designer. He did all of our costumes. And he and I were actually partners. So he's the ballerina, though? Yeah, he's yeah. the ballerina. He's Kitri, and I'm uh, Basilio. Yes, and I see. He... And you look as if you're about to drop him, frankly. Oh, well, yeah, that's part of the joke. <laughs> so actually, we were living together in New York, and uh, he was making all the costumes for Trocadero, and I was helping, you know, putting the sequence on and stuff like that. And there was something in the uh, city of New York, uh, City University of New York would have a cable TV show. And every Sunday and Wednesday, they would show these old... Russian ballets that no one had ever seen in America because it was the day, you know, early days of video and so on and so forth. So we started watching these videos and while well, we were making the costumes. And the, uh, at first we were laughing because it was so old, quote unquote, old fashioned. And then we started to really love it. Uh, so we were watching like Ala Sizova do Sleeping Beauty uh, with. Um, uh, uh, so Solovyev, probably. Yes, and yeah. uh, Dudinskaya was doing uh, Karabas, and um, uh, you know other videos like that. Uh, Elena Yevtiva doing Esmeralda, uh, Maya Plisetskaya doing Swan Lake, Yulanova doing Giselle. You know, I mean, all these great divas of the Russian ballet. And so I got totally hooked. And I had already been in, in Ballet Trocadero uh, at that point as a dancer, and I thought this is exactly what the company should be about. And um, I started implementing that in my performances to the best I could. And then um, 
when I became director, I started really pushing that. And that's where we are today. Let's look at a couple of these muses. Here's one. Magical. It is, absolutely, from, and from another time. But it also shows the, the technical standards that you were having to aim towards in summoning up, parodying this, this era. The next one, though, is more what you might call, I don't think they intend to be comic, but you'll see what I mean. I, I think it's the, the, the man's arrival, is the eye, eye catcher here. This is 1911 Bolshoi. Um, clip of a partnership, Yekaterina Geltzer and Vasily Tikomirov. Um, I, what makes Geltzer a true troc muse is that she was once heard telling a colleague backstage at the Bolshoi when she was well over 60 and still dancing, help me get myself up on point. After that, I know what to do. <laughs> and, uh, um, every Monday, I go, I go on YouTube and I find it's called Ballerina Monday. And I send out something with the bio. I sent this out last Monday. I, I find it poetic. Uh, you know, it's a different time. He obviously is shaped differently than people often are today. But they're really giving a performance. They are giving a performance. And that is magical. And I think you would be hard-pressed to find someone who would have the guts to do that with so little material. There's not that much material no, up there. That's right. Uh, and yet it's still very engaging. Uh, so, I actually find it charming. Actually, this, this combination of charm and parody is a very difficult to one to pull off. And especially as I was thinking about how you would define the characters of the trocs, because they seem to me to be what you might call the resentful ones, the relics, the ones who got left behind when Pavlova and the hotshots went off to the Ballet Russe. And you've got all the squabbling divas left behind who carry on dancing far too long. Also, of course, you have the battle going on between the men and the women, and quite often you have these, these stories going on where the, the, the man is, is, you might call, unsuitable to be <laughs> handling the woman when she's this high and he's that. We saw this the other night, mm. we, pas de trois, mm -hmm. with uh, your male was, I don't know, five foot two, and the women were six foot six or something. He's <laughs> a little taller than that, but he appears, <laughs> you know, they are very, very tall, uh, especially on point. But they also have these wonderful names, which all seem to convey the idea of superannuation. You know, never say never. Um, uh, Call it a day, I think, is such a clever one. I do love Margot Mundane. And the, these pictures show, they, very helpfully, they line up in the same positions, men and women. So you can see how they look in the male roles and the female roles. This isn't necessarily the latest um, troc uh, group. This was from a recent program list. 
But um, the reason that people join the trocks now, is it because they want to dance principally the female roles, because those are what you can't dance anywhere else, or is it because it's a comic troupe? Well, we have a variety. We have people who are, are just enamored with point work. I mean, when I joined in 1980, we weren't really enamored with point work because most guys didn't do it. But now it's very common for a man, a, bo a young boy in school, to have a pair of point shoes. So they're enamored with point work, for sure. Uh, they are also uh, um, interested in the comedy aspect of it, for sure. Uh, you know, th they tend to be free-spirited guys, and when you go into a regular ballet company, you don't have a lot of room to be free-spirited. Also, on stage, we, we encourage free spirit, uh, and no one is, is put into a, uh, a box. So that's also very um, revealing for the dancers who want to be free-spirited. And then we also have people who are, are into drag uh, and want to do that. Um, so it's a combination of all of that uh, before. Before, for sure, it was just you were interested in comedy and having fun on stage. But now, because society has changed so much, it's, it's very different. Do you find that the point work is something that you are very picky about when you, when you hire guys, that they've got to be super good at it because there's competition now around? Uh, no, uh, I don't feel picky. Uh, the technically, I mean, technically gifted for point work. Presumably no, they've all got to be very good at it. No, uh, if you are technically gifted as a dancer, uh, point work is not a big problem for you, even if you haven't been exposed to it. It's sort of like tennis. Uh, males and females go on the court and they practice the same strokes and the same um, the same training. The only difference was the point work is just a, there's a little extra something. Uh, so it, it's the same dynamic. So if you're interested in dancing on point, then you learn very quickly. Uh, if you're not interested in dancing on point, you will never learn. But uh, we have hired people who had no point work, but they, they were um, interested and uh, you could also tell they had a sense of humor, and you could also tell they were uh, team players, and so they brought other strengths to the uh, company. When you joined, how did you feel about learning point work? Well, I had in, uh, studied some point work in these teachers I had in Texas. They had a Friday uh, morning point class. They said, oh, why don't you come? It'll be good for you. It's, it'll be strengthening to your feet. So I went. So it wasn't... Um, uh, strange to me. I could get up and down on point. But a lot of the guys can't. And you can actually tell back then if someone was too afraid. They wanted the job, but they were too afraid to go up on point. So those people aren't uh, suitable for the company. You have to be willing to take that risk. I wondered if you were influenced at all by Nureyev, because in the 60s, when he was describing how he elongated his line and really changed the, the charisma and the, I mean, we see how flat-footed that dancer was in the older film, was he was after trying to get the ballerina foot. I mean, he went on demi-point, but it was a very, very stretched foot. And I think he wanted to emulate that. Uh, I was not aware of that, actually. Um, mm. it, he talks about it, you see it in his biographies, he talks about his, his, his love of the, the, of the stretched foot and the, the leg line of the, of the woman in ballet. Um, of course, he always felt he had short legs, so he was always trying to elongate it. I, I think for most individuals, especially if you were younger, uh, the, the uh, key is uh, obsession. So what happens if someone gets obsessed with something and then really wants to do it and wants to excel in it? And you find all your um, inspirations from that. Um, and that can come from videos now, or in the old days it would come from um, you know, the old-time movies, for instance, the old-time comedians. Uh, because, you know, back then in the 60s and 70s, we didn't really, in America, have access to this. I mean, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. There wasn't a lot of um, ballet there at all. Uh, I think the first ballet company I saw was the Bolshoi. They came to the Shrine Auditorium. The schools brought us there. The only thing I remember is the legs of the little swans going like this, and I thought that was the most hilarious thing I had ever seen. So that's where it sort of started. So um, the inspiration that you would have mentioned would have come much later, when after I was already an adult and in Trocadero, mm -hmm. and watching those videos. But the, the funny thing about the Trocaderos, which makes them work so well as, as, as a comedy act, is this greater dimension of them being very serious about paying homage to this lost era of a particularly very high Russian classical style. Did the trocks always have a semi-serious historical bent, or did that grow with time? Uh, 
um, you know, it's hard. It, everything grows with time. So I, I can't say that it started. Actually, I can say it started specifically. Uh, I had just become the director of Ballet Trocadero, and I went to see San Francisco Ballet, uh, which is a very good company at City Center Theater in New York, which is, you know, like the Coliseum, let's say, here in London. And they didn't do one tutu ballet. It was all spandex. And I wanted to see a tutu. And I thought, well, this is a ballet company. If I want to see you know, everything in spandex, I'll go see the Netherlands Dance Theater, uh, which is a gorgeous company. But you know, you know what to expect. Or I'd see the Martha Graham Company. So I thought, we're not doing this. Trocadero is not doing this. We're going backwards. So that's really where it started. And that was in the early 1990s. And so I got in touch with this uh, Russian ballerina, Elena Kunikova who danced in the Mali Opera Ballet, which is now the Mikhailovsky Ballet. And uh, we became very friendly. And uh, slowly but surely, we started working together. And uh, we, I started saying, um, do you have these older ballets that we can uh, see and do? And, and she said, yes. She had everything on video from Russia when she was in Russia. So I would go over to her house, and we would look at these videos that were fantastic. And this was, don't forget, before YouTube. I had absolutely no access to it. And so it just sort of generated like that. And then we came to the UK. And the critics here loved the idea that we were doing this. So uh, it just reinforced that idea. So we started, by then we came, let's say it was 1998 or something like that. And it reinforced it. And we started really pushing that uh, in, a, in a calculated way uh, and garnered um, you know, the critics, if they're on your side, it's a very good thing, right? So uh, the critics were very encouraging. They loved it. And uh, and you remember, you were one of those. I was one of them. Yes. And uh, so we went in that direction. And even today, the ballet companies aren't doing that. They're going still forward, forward, forward. Uh, although uh, Redmansky is, uh, and other people in Russia are going backwards as well in terms of that. But that, that's really where it started. Here's Elena Kunikova, a little bit of her hair. You know, gravity is the same for all of us, men, women. First of all, one has to be well balanced and stable because if one is falling, he cannot do anything. So we worked on everything that needed to be worked on. Technique, strength, style, expressiveness. You know, my list is very long, I can go on. I was just fed up with being in the back and lifting girls and doing choreography, neoclassical, that I really didn't enjoy that much. I love dancing, period. So, you know, the steps in ballet are all the same. It's just how they're implemented for men and women. I enjoy the challenge of doing the female choreography. It's on point because I have the power and the physicality of a man, but I can still play with the delicacy that a woman has. Oh yeah, my friends know I'm in the truck right now. They're like, wow, are you in the truck? I'm so happy for you. I said, yeah, I'm happy too. Yeah, they're jealous. They said like, wow, oh my god, that's like so good, amazing. I said, yeah, thank you. Have they ever seen you dress as a woman? No, <laughs> never. Oh, he's adorable. He is adorable. He that's, that's how June. <laughs> He's from China. I have to say, he's saying something that I need to pin, I need to talk about a bit. We're not dressing as women. At no point do we want the audience to think that we're women because we're not. We are men. And we are, you know, like Dame Edna is a man. Everyone knows he's, he's a man. He has developed this character. That's exactly what we do. We develop characters from the old diva ballerinas of the old days. And that's really what we're trying to project. It does, and we use drag to do that. And drag is a, only means that you're dressing in the, uh, in the clothing of the opposite sex. So there's all sorts of different kinds of drag. And so I call what we do theater drag, N not trying to be women, because that's not what we do and not what we want to do. It's a fine line, isn't it? Because you, you, are, you don't want to be um, drag showbiz. You are combining drag 
and some of that, I think this is why England loves you so much, because you appeal not only to our sense of vaudeville and music hall, and cross-dressing has, you know, has been long an innocent past uh, pleasure in, in British theatre and music, musical theatre. Um, but then you also, as you say, you've got this historical, um, traditional Russian thing that actually speaks very much to the British ballet tradition here. Well, there, there's actually a movement that happened in the late 60s and early 70s in America. Uh, and it was spearheaded by this, actually, this man named Charles Ludlum, who actually wrote, uh, uh, he wrote his own plays. He had his own company. It was called the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. And he's very instrumental in what Trocadero does. Trocadero actually came out of what he did. And he wrote all these plays based on historical characters. Uh, uh, from literature or history, Maria Callas, he did Gallus. He also did something about Camille and uh, um, Egyptian. And he did it as a man. Uh, he, he still had all his chest hair. He's, he had the outfit of, you know, of Maria Callas. But he never projected female. He projected character. And the character was a diva of the opera, or uh, Camille, you know, um, somebody who, um, you know, a courtesan. So that's really where Trocadero came out of. He actually, in this case, asked somebody to be the dying swan in one of his, um, his um, productions. And that person went on to form the Trocadero. And that's where the, the lineage is, is that it's not club drag, is what I call it, which is actually female impersonation. It's theater drag. It's like Kabuki. The Onigata, uh, you know, doing female roles by males, it's different than what we do, but it's a different kind of drag. Uh, and so we do theater drag, getting involved in these characters in the ballet canon for comedy. So it, to me, it's not really a fine line. It's very clear. Yes. And so when we're talking in rehearsal, I have a really good point of view about how to approach this. So we get a lot of, of course, a lot of gay men, uh, young gay guys who come, and they don't quite get it. And I have to say, you're not imitating a young girl. You are, you are actually getting into the character of, let's say, the Swan Queen or whoever it happens to be. You have to find out who that character is, and you have to project that. And that's where our comedy comes from. And if that's not what they're in Ballet Trocadero for, they actually don't last very long because it's not very satisfying to them. But most of the guys who, who are in Trocadero agree with that, and that's what they try to emulate. It's theatrical character playing, yes. I mean, at a double layer, because if you're Vanya Varicosa, you've got to know who Vanya Varicosa is, and then how would Vanya Varicosa approach dancing Esmeralda or the Swan Queen? And then so you're working at this double layer, which is, which is tricky and fun, actually, because if Vanya Varicosa's um, feeling moody one night, then she might dance it rather differently from another night when she's feeling perky. <laughs> well, well it's, it's actually hideously complicated because you also have to wear point shoes and a tutu and a wig and eyelashes and the makeup is, makes everything is very hot. And you have to also have a comedic effect and you have to do the, uh, you know, the ballet steps, which are hard. Uh, so it's super complicated. Uh, and you end up uh, losing your mind a little bit. And that's when where the real comedy starts, because they're free, they're having fun, and it's complicated. Um, and that's where the interesting thing about Trocadero for me is, and I don't get a chance to talk about this very often in this way because um, it doesn't come up, people aren't interested, so I, I thank you for allowing me to say that. I'm very interested in how you edit the comedy, because presumably your job as artistic director is to hire the right guys who you think have got the character ability that, and, and the ability to let go on stage and create comedy. Um, but at the same time, you've also got to edit the jokes, haven't you? Because you're, in one way, you're telling the same joke over and over and over and over again. I mean, Swan Queen, I mean, Swan Lake is a whole series of, of familiar jokes. I love seeing the jokes again and again. But um, on the other hand, you're also introducing jokes that go with new characters and you've got to keep them fresh all the time are you the jokes editor also your biographies and your programs are unbelievably funny <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah um well the bios actually are a lot of the bios are from the old days uh you know and that that i recycle because i'm into i really love kabuki theater and in kabuki the names continue the families 
uh, Nakamura, the uh, bandos, you know, it's a family. So it, it's my way of playing homage to how important kabuki in Japan has been for the tro trocadero. But we do get new names all the time. For instance, I was at my uh, uh, good friend's uh, house, and we were visiting his mother, and she's uh, a Polish uh, Jewish woman, and she speaks Yiddish, and she said, ah, oh, I went to this place in Pepe Dufka. And I said, well, what is that? And she goes, oh, it's a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere, you know. And th that became a name, Pepe, Pepe Dufka. Pepe Dufka. I mean, only a Yiddish person necessarily would know that, but uh, I thought it was hilarious. So we do have these, like, in-jokes that certain people... Uh, and Pepe Dufka is, of course, a leading man. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. He's our ballet master now. He <laughs> retired a few years ago. Uh, so in terms of the jokes, I mean, don't forget, for instance, Swan Lake. Uh, the, the jokes actually are sort of the same, but each individual is encouraged to do it in their own way. We don't say you have to do it this way. Uh, first of all, you wouldn't get to do the Swan Queen unless you were already within understanding what we are trying to project. So it's usually the people who've been around a while, and they are encouraged to find their own aspect to it. So that's what keeps it fresh. I mean, they are actually... Uh, being their own comedian. But also, the, what we're also trying to do is that we're trying to shape the show so that you don't see the same thing all night long. Because there's nothing more boring than seeing the same thing all night long. So Swan Lake is not that uh, sophisticated. It's yes. campy. So the second act, you have a little sophistication. And then you have the dying swan closing the act, which, of course, is campy again. And then we finish the, the evening with a big ballet with everyone in. So you're really seeing a lot of things. Uh, so you're not really beaten over the head with the same drag jokes. We can talk about the, the, the seriousness of the kind of uh, resurrections that you do, because as you say, you, you do ballets that people really wouldn't see anymore. I mean, your spoof of the Bolshoi is Walpurgisnacht. It's actually, Esmeralda has now become a sort of seriously sought after rarity, I think, among the reconstruction folks. Um, this is Robert Lara actually rehearsing. You see how this is serious stuff. So that's interesting there. He actually is doing, uh, with the Esmeralda I was referencing before was actually the Pas de Cis, uh -huh. which is in the ballet. And this is another part of the ballet. So, uh, And he actually uh, is Mexican. He's not with the company now. but uh, And he did his, he did his schooling, uh, research under this uh, Pas de Deux, which is done a lot in uh, competitions a lot. You see it a lot in competitions. So he felt really um, passionate about this because he had done a lot of research on it and had done a paper at school about it and did he, a good he job. He trained at that or danced with the National Ballet of Cuba no, this, before you, no, Lara, no, no, didn't No, National you? Ballet of Mexico. But there's real attention there, isn't there, to the... Nobody would dance that, put that on stage, unless they wanted to show us that high classical technique and the, the beauty of that particular vocabulary. I am sorry to say that no. is not our motivation. It comes across. Our motivation <laughs> is to entertain the audience. We uh. want to have the audience engaged 
and enjoy themselves. I, when I look around and I'm sitting in the auditorium and I see people with these smiling faces, I'm pretty happy. Uh, when I, it's interesting at the Peacock when the people are going up the stairs, they're talking about the show and how much they enjoyed it. And they always say, my God, it was so much fun, but I never expected the dancers to be that good. That's the common expression. Um, so we, as dancers, are ballet nerds. So we try to make it interesting for us by doing these old ballets, which we love. And we're bringing along with us other ballet nerds who want to see that. So it, it's, it's not the same motivation there. The motivation for us is to entertain the audience, to capture the audience, to, to show a kind of ballet comedy with a sensibility that is rooted in all sorts of areas. Um, this next bit, I think, completely encapsulates what you've just been saying. Um, two of my favorite trucks of all, um, the deathless Ida Nivis <laughs> Um uh, And one of the things I love is you'll notice her when she finishes her solo. She totters back very slightly at the end and just hopes nobody will notice. And it's such a subtle joke. Um, the other one hardly needs any introduction. Yeah, that, that actually might not be a joke. She might be almost falling over, and it does work because... Don't uh, spot. You just shattered another of my illusions. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? She, Ida, Ida was falling over. Oh. <laughs> that was a good save. <laughs> I'm sorry to have ruined yeah. the illusion. <laughs> oh, that, that's actually Nadia Rambova. Oh, sorry. I'll clutch it. And that's Margot Monday. That's Margot Mundane. So you can see the head going up and down. That actually, we, we work on that. That's hard. You bury. People don't want to do that. No. Whose idea with the glasses? Uh, it was no one's idea. He, uh, his contacts dropped into the sink and he couldn't see. So he said, what do I do? I said, put on your glasses. That's how it happened. I mean, brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. He actually... Uh, He uh, went on to, he uh, left the company a few years ago and went on to have a really great career as a makeup artist. He has won an Emmy uh, in America, and there's a, a show called Pose, uh, which is well known in the United States. Um, I think it was here also, and he worked on the makeup for that uh, TV series. So there is life after the Trocadero. Uh, just turning back to the, the, the comedy and pitching the comedy, because of course that changes over time, and obviously it must change with different countries you go to, but I always felt that Troc's comedy has a great kindness, a kind of innocence about it. Although it's bitchy, it manages to be innocent also. You can really love it and laugh with it. There's nothing, I was going to say, there's nothing cruel about it, except the things that they do to each other on stage do seem to be kind and cruel. But there is a line, isn't there, with drag performance, particularly nowadays, where it crosses into difficult areas of, of um, 
you know, there's the slightly porny side of drag, and there's also the very difficult now gender politics line. Um, have you found these are new lines that become more difficult to negotiate now than you used to have in the past? Um, well, that's uh, the exact question I was hoping you wouldn't ask. Uh, it, it's more complicated now. Uh, it, I don't feel like it's more complicated. Uh, uh, other people's perceptions think it's complicated. Uh, I have a, um, a specific way of looking at things, and um, uh, it's, it's not re necessarily related to that. Uh, there was a, uh, there's an uh, opera singer named Alice Coote. Do you know her? Yeah, yeah Alice she's... Coote is a British mezzo, yeah. marvelous singer. Marvelous, and she um, does a lot of, what they, they're called trouser roles, as you know, you know and she does a lot of the male roles in, um, in these operas. And a few years ago in The Guardian, she wrote this article about how does it affect her in terms of gender and this and that as, as performing as a man in all of her career. And she goes at great length about it. Uh, and it's super interesting, and she really captures that issue. And um, uh, I send it to every Trocadero who, mem who joins. I send this article to them, and I send it once a year. I just sent it last week to everyone again to read. Um, she says uh, when she, you know, don't forget, she's spending all of her career uh, trying to emulate a male character. She's not trying to be a male. She's not trying to pretend she's a male. She's emulating a male character. And she says in the last part of the article, when I go into a room by myself, am I a man or a woman? Or do I float in between these different uh, personalities, these different bodies, the dif different emotions? And she goes, yes, that's what I do. I'm not a man and I'm not a woman. Because, so now I'm editorializing it. Because what does that mean, being a man or a woman? I mean. You can ask anybody, and everybody will have their own opinion. I don't know what the answer to that is. We float between these. We're humans. You know, we, we, we try to relate to each other if you're elevated as a human. If you want to act like John Wayne, then you obviously are in the stereotype of some macho person. Or if you want to be uh, Marilyn Monroe, you you know, obviously are getting involved in that character. But they weren't like that in the real life. I mean, Marilyn Monroe was probably a completely normal, sweet person, and John Wayne was probably a teddy bear. But their projection of that is. So it's really how you are perceived in, in society, which, which uh, dictates the gender. And the point is just to get away from that. So I tell the dancers, just be yourself. Don't put on what you think a man or a woman is. Get into the character and be yourself. And that takes a long time to figure out, it, maybe your whole life. Yes, because actually it, in a sense, is running in parallel to what the Trox is all about, which is a very simple thing, men, male ballerinas, which is about two very clear ideas. Here's a man, here's a woman, the man is dancing the woman. Uh, and it is more fluid and it is more discussed today and you have to be much more careful in how you consider issues like that. And on stage, I wonder if, um, I mean, you had an issue a few years back where one of your dancers wanted to be effectively taken as a gender fluid person as opposed to a male dancing female and actually landed up being hired as a female dancer by English National Ballet for a year, eventually. And there was a very interesting example where you thought, here is a guy whose ethos is, you might say, in touch with the modern world now about gender, but actually makes it very difficult to be part of the Trox because the Trox have got this very specific thing about you're not a woman coming to dance a woman, you're a man coming to dance a woman. There is that issue, but it's not really an issue that... It, uh, it's, it's an intellectual issue because it really hasn't happened. The person that you're talking about, the, his job was never in jeopardy. So there's a difference between brand and tradition. So what does that actually mean? I'm not sure that we would be able to tour widely, for instance, in the United States, if we were uh, a mixed sex uh, group. Uh, and so what does that mean? The women would have to do male roles, and the males would have to do women's roles, which is fine. And that's what I have always said when someone comes to me with that. But there are no women who actually want to do what we do who want to pick up men, who want to do double tours, who wants to do entrecies, they're too busy enjoying what they're doing. So it's not really an issue. It's, uh, it's, an, it's an intellectual um, game 
but it's not really a real issue. So I try not to uh, worry about it. Do you find that, I mean, are there places you really can't play in? I mean, how do, how do you play in the Middle East, for instance? Does that well, work? Well, we've only been to Israel. Uh, uh -huh. We went to Turkey once, which is, I guess, the Middle East, right? And we went to Bodrum, which has a big dance festival. And, and how did that go down with the Turks? Perfectly fine. Uh, I, 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 we probably would not be booked into Dubai or Saudi Arabia. What about Russia? I mean, you're taking coals to Newcastle when you take your, um, your ballerinas <laughs> to Russia. Um, let's uh, accept the present circumstances, which I'm sure made a big difference all round. But when you went there, you've been there a few times, haven't you? How yeah, have you we've been, been received? We were supposed to go in uh, December of this year. Uh, obviously, the war has made that impossible. And uh, we wouldn't want to also. But um, the, the Russia actually has been one of our greatest places. Uh, even Elena Kunikova, Russian, when she comes to rehearse us, she laughs at other things that we, that, that we don't laugh at. She's really laughing at certain things that we don't laugh at. We laugh a little. We chuckle. She's belly laughing. And the Russian audience did the same thing. They were laughing uproariously at things that we found funny, but not that much. Uh, also, we, you know, we wear a lot of crazy Bond wigs, and um, many years ago we went, uh, and um, who is the uh, famous uh, father and son? Uh, Liepa. Yes. So his mother... What, Maris Liepa and Andres Liepa. Yeah, the, the son, right? Andres. His mother was in the auditorium, and, uh, and he said, she said, oh my God, this male character looks just like my son because we were wearing a wig just like his. So they really enjoy it. They really get it. Um, for instance, the British really get it in terms of the comedy and the knowledgeable people get the ballet. But the Russians, most of the audience was super knowledgeable about ballet. What about the choreographers that you take off? Because now you've started doing modern ones. I mean, you've got um, a, uh, let's say, Balanchine there. And you've got Lila Brodsky, obviously. Uh, you've got... Um, a, a sort of Graham, you've got a sort of Pina Bausch. I mean, do you, uh, Cunningham, you've got a Cunningham. I mean, have you had choreographers, uh, do you have to go and beg them to do one of their pieces and how do they react? I usually don't beg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, my motto is if you want to work with us, great. And if you don't, we're not your cup of tea, that's fine. So we've been turned down by a number of people who are, uh, or not people, but foundations. Uh, for instance, uh, should I name names? Oh, go on. The Anthony Tudor Foundation wouldn't even respond to my emails. I had emailed um, um, uh, Frederick Ashton Foundation, didn't respond. Uh, I asked specifically for a Balanchine ballet to the foundation. They said no. So, uh, so that happens. And I understand that because we have to play around a little bit with it. We just can't do it as set choreographed by Ashton. Please tell me which Ashton you would want to do, or styling, styling um, version of. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was um, uh, birthday. Um, birthday offering. Oh, the ballerina yeah. one. Yeah. yeah Seven yeah. ballerinas. Yeah, also he, d he did a really nice uh, La Valse to Ravel. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, the music is great, and the, the dancing is great, and um, I didn't say this, but we could have played with that a little you bit. You could. You had a lot of falling over going on yes, in there. <laughs> but, uh, and marvelous dresses. Yeah, yeah, the dresses are great. And, but I understand why. You know, they don't want us fooling around with it. Cunningham was actually, uh, where's Cunningham, who has passed away a few years ago, actually was the first person who allowed us to do uh, a Cunningham piece. So he offered us, uh, or we licensed a ballet called Cross Currents, which was um, premiered actually at Sadler's Wells in the 60s. And so th the story of that was uh, the story of Ballet Trocadero, where we don't quite know what we're doing and we don't know how to proceed. So uh, Meg Harper, who had danced in the company in the 60s, came in and said it. it was seven minutes. You know, it was hard, but we did it. And we, I went to try to get the music from that Cunningham and used. And... Um, was that a John Cage school? No, it was not, uh, Colin Nancaro. Uh -huh. And uh, they wanted so much money for you know, three minutes, like hundreds of dollars per performance. So I said, there's no way we can afford that, and no way we want to afford it. 
So I went back to the studio and I said, we don't have the music, so let's improvise some music. So the ballet mistress at the time started banging on her, on the table and clapping. And uh, it was soon we were all laughing because we were making up all these improv improvisational noises, you know. Uh, people were barking, you know, which is very much like John Cage, right? So we said, oh my God, there, we won't change, we can't, Cunningham said we couldn't change a step. We had to do it exactly as is. And so we just said, okay, well, let's see what happens. We just found the, the humor out of nowhere, just like that. It was a total accident. So we put two dancers on stage who were musicians, and they are on stage um, improvising a la John Cage. And no one watches the dancers at all. They only watch the musicians, and they're doing ridiculous things. It's funny. It's one of our best pieces. So he actually came to see the show at the Joyce Theater in New York City and thought the dancing was fine, you know, ballet dancers trying to do Cunningham work, but he was offended by the, uh, the parody of John Cage, which is ridiculous because John Cage used to do the wildest things, you know. So, okay, so he pulled the piece and uh, we re-choreographed it and called it something else and continued to do it, and we do it to this day. And it's very funny. It's I saw very, it on a previous story. Funny. And it also offers something new because it's a completely different type of comedy. Uh, the other person who allowed us to do something, uh, the executive director of the Agnes Mill Foundation, allowed us to do the de debut at the opera, which also premiered here in mm -hmm. London in the 40s. Over 50 years, a lot has gone on in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the trocks were born in very inflammatory social circumstances and today whole new flare-ups with, with Russia and so on. And I mean, when you look at those 70s trocks, look at them, compared with, <laughs> I mean, they look like jocks, don't they? And then compared with the very beautiful ladies taking tea at the Savoy, I think that was the last British tour. Um, do you feel that the trucks continue to evolve, can continue to evolve, or they seem to me to be terribly tied up with your own success at running the company. I mean, you have been running it since, I think you saved it, didn't you? It, it nearly folded, and by 1990, when you stepped up, you took it over, you rescued the trucks, and it's been very much your... Um... You know, when the trucks almost fell apart uh, for two reasons. The first reason was the AIDS epidemic came in and just killed everybody. Uh, except some of us, obviously. And then uh, the political climate in, the national, in uh, America with the National Endowments of the Arts, they went very, very, very conservative with this senator named Jesse Helms. And they, even though we weren't getting any grants, <clears throat> the theaters were getting grants and they were afraid to book us because um, they were afraid of losing their grants because of you know, what we were doing. So, when, so the company was nearly folded at that point. Uh, we had no performances. And so I said to the executive director, I said, you know, why don't we try this? Why don't we try that? And he and I and Mike Gonzalez and some other people, we got together and we formed this point of view, which we've been talking about now. Uh, the thing that really saved us was Japan because Japan didn't have that prejudice. They were very, they were in the middle of a dance boom. Uh, they, you know, ballet was as big to the Japanese audience as it was to, to all of us in the West. And they have this wacky sense of humor, you know, that uh, if you watch Japanese TV, I mean, it, it's so absurdist, you know, it's hilarious. And also they did not have trouble uh, with the gender fluidity, you know, it, it's not really an issue there at all. And they had the tradition of the kabuki. So there was none of the political ramifications that we're having in the States. So we started going to Japan every year and we became increasingly popular. And uh, we started doing these long three-month tours every year in the summer, uh, 40 performances every year. So it became very important for us to appeal to the audience, the Japanese audience. And the Japanese audience wanted funniness, and they wanted good dancing. So in order to survive, we tried to give both. The one <clears throat> really technical thing is, is if you go to the Kabuki Theater and uh, the curtain opens, you can see it because the light, it's almost the absence of light. It's so bright. You can see every face. You can see every expression on the thing. So I started saying to our lighting people, and sometimes I made them cry, we need to see this. More light, please. 
Uh, and no matter how light it was, it was never bright enough. So when you go to a Trocadero performance, you can see it, correct? You Absolutely. can see the faces. About the only thing you can see on the London stage has got enough light on Dance it. Dance is so dark now, you can't see it. So, uh, you know, would I have known that by not going to the, uh, being obsessed with Kabuki theater for, mm. you know, 25 years? Maybe I would have, maybe I wouldn't have, but I, I saw it in real action in Japan, and I said, this is what we have to do, because th you, if you can't see the face, facial expressions, it's not funny. Uh, so... So that's how it worked. And it worked in the UK. It works in the UK for all the reasons that we've been talking about. And here you are on your 17th UK tour. <laughs> yeah. Having also survived not just the AIDS epidemic, but the COVID yeah. um, problems, well, which have been dreadful for everybody. And for thank everybody. goodness you're back here to make us laugh on even when we're all supposed to be in grand state mourning. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And it's... The audience response is so boisterous and so uh, uh, enthusiastic that that actually is a freeing uh, element. And so the audience allows everyone to feel really comfortable with what they're doing and to be free. Because it's sort of like, you know, when you go to a party and you say, you tell some jokes and no one laughs, you get very tight. But if everyone's laughing, you, start, you get less tight. So that, that's the main contribution for us. How many pairs of shoes do they each travel with? Uh, well, um, in the old days, we were only allowed about 10 a year, even though we did 150 performances. So you really had to save them. But there's a new brand of shoe called Gainer Minden, which is made out of plastic. So that really lasts a long time. Uh, for this tour, it was actually very stressful because um, there's a supply chain problem now in the United States. So we went in to order the shoes in April, and they're not arriving until... November, so uh, that had never happened before. That the, some dancers didn't have any shoes at all until, uh, but they called the block store here in London and they had their size. Emergency shoes with the trucks required. It was very stressful. Yeah. Uh, what do you you know? How do you put on a ballet performance without point shoes? You know?